This video contains more information about the confidence interval. The confidence interval seems like a fairly artificial statistical tool to find the range within which a population parameter lies. I'm hoping to show you soon that this confidence interval is extremely useful in engineering work. In the prior video, we left our derivation by learning something new about the central limit theorem. We learned that the mean that we calculate from our independent samples is also from a normal distribution, with the same mean as the original sample data. The other interesting thing that we learned is that the calculated average has the same variance as the raw sample data, but divided by a factor of n. Practically speaking, that meant that if our original data came from the broad histogram shown here, then the distribution of the average comes from this much narrower distribution. The interpretation is that if we take many samples and average them, we get a better estimate of the mean, with less error. The one issue we had, though, for calculating that confidence interval was that we required to know the true population standard deviation. This is not something we know in practice. This video shows how we can relax that requirement. So what we do is to use an estimate of the standard deviation, which we now call s. We replace sigma with this s here in the denominator. The z value for x bar, however, is modified. It is no longer normally distributed. Rather, it is now t distributed. Compare these two equations to see the change. There is, however, one assumption required to make this work. The raw data used now have to come from the normal distribution. That's a fairly strong assumption. But we have a tool in place to check for that, the QQ plot. Previously, our assumption was that the xi values came from any distribution of finite variance. Since we are introducing a new distribution here, the t distribution, we should examine it a little more closely to understand its properties. The t distribution is also symmetric, and it has a similar shape to the normal distribution. It is shown here as the thin line. It is slightly lower at the peak, but a little broader in the tails. It also has a cumulative area of 1.0 under the thin curve. Because the areas are related to probability, we can look at tables to find the fractional area under the curve. I will introduce these tables shortly. The t distribution only has one parameter that we have to specify, the number of degrees of freedom. Contrast that to the normal distribution, where we have to specify two parameters, the mean and standard deviation. The degrees of freedom alter the shape of that distribution. With higher degrees of freedom, the t distribution approaches the normal distribution shape. So back to our confidence interval. As long as we take samples from a normal distribution, where the mean is mu and the variance is sigma squared, then we can take n samples and calculate the average. As before, we can standardize that average, the x bar, and find a z value for it. It is now that z value that is t distributed, with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. That z value has lower and upper critical limits. We find our critical values from the t distribution instead of the normal distribution. Written here mathematically, we say there is a lower ct value and an upper ct value that will contain the z with a certain degree of probability. These ct values are found from a table. Take a look at this table now. We know our degrees of freedom, so let's use, for example, a value of degrees of freedom of 15. That implies that n was equal to 16. If we were calculating a 95% confidence interval, we would like 2.5% in the left tail and 2.5% in the right tail. So in the column for 0.025, we can read down and see the critical value is 2.13. We are doing, like we did before, finding the z value on the horizontal axis that has a cumulative area of 2.5% under the curve. In R, you would use the QT function as follows. QT 0.025 and then DF equals 15. The answer is minus 2.13 because it is the lower tail. If you wanted the upper tail where the cumulative area is 97.5% leaving 2.5% remaining on the right, then say QT 0.975 comma 15 and that gets you the same answer with the sign flipped. So let's use this now and return to the example from the earlier video. We had these nine measurements, and our goal is to find a confidence interval for the true mean. We don't know the standard deviation, 
but we can estimate it from the data as s equals 3.81. If we want to use the new concepts we just learned, we also have to ensure that these nine raw data samples are normally distributed. We have the QQ plot to test that, and the plot here shows that it is normal. Now on to the calculations. The z value, as we said earlier, is from the t distribution. We can say that with 95% probability that the z value, if we were able to calculate it, can be found between lower and upper critical values of CT. Pause the video and read the CT values from the table for this problem and also use R to calculate them. You must be comfortable with both options. Did you find a value of about plus or minus 2.3? If you use the table, you can use a rough visual interpolation between the rows of 5 and 10 to find an approximate value. That's because there isn't a row with 8 degrees of freedom. Don't worry about an exact interpolation. In R, you would have used QT 0 0.975,8. Now substitute, as we did in the prior video, the equation for Z. Rearrange the inequality, leaving the parameter mu in the middle. This gives a lower and upper bound. We know all the terms in here. The x bar and s values are calculated, the ct values are plus and minus 2.3, and the number of samples is 9. Subbing in those numbers gives bounds of 17.1 and 22.9. That gives us bounds that we have a confidence of 95% of containing the true mean. I would like to compare this to the bounds from the earlier video, 17.7, to 22.3. Those bounds were from when we happened to know the true standard deviation. Our revised bounds of 17.1 to 22.9 in this video are a little wider. That is because we have used imperfect knowledge of the standard deviation. We have only estimated the standard deviation. That error in the estimation propagates itself into the calculation for the bounds. The bounds must be wider to get the same level of confidence. Not knowing the true standard deviation implies that our confidence interval must be wider to account for that lack of certainty. And perhaps you might also see now why it makes sense that the t-distribution approaches the normal distribution with a large number of degrees of freedom. If you measured many samples, your estimate of the standard deviation improves, so much so that you essentially know it. Then, you are back to the case where the z value is normally distributed, instead of t distributed. If that last part isn't clear to you, also watch the next video, where it is explained in a different way.